Coming up on DTNS, why the messenger revamp could mean better code in the future for Facebook, a smart way to get your local news, and security stories from RSA, including the man who sent his mom to do pen testing at a prison. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Ah, we're very happy to welcome Seth Rosenblatt, editor-in-chief and founder of The Parallax at the-parallax.com. Uh, welcome back, Seth. How's it going? Great. Great to talk with you all again. We were uh, just uh, talking with Seth about Japan and, and some of the, the highlights of, of his time living there, as, as our visits there. If you want to get that expanded show, you got to become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS and choose one of the good day internet tiers. Let's start here with a few tech things you should know. Cancellations keep coming. Google announced it will not host an in-person Google I.O. event on May 12th out of concern for the COVID-19 virus. Google is looking into an alternative format for the event, however. Tickets will be refunded on March 13th, if not before. Facebook and Twitter have both pulled out of the South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas, due to virus concerns. Although organizers of the event say that it is still proceeding as planned in March. In addition, Facebook is restricting visits to its offices and conducting job interviews primarily primarily by video conference, and Twitter is encouraging its 4,800 employees to work from home. Yeah, in fact, ZDNet uh, put together a whole page of all the tech conference cancellations and travel restrictions, uh, if you want to keep track of that. Uh, meanwhile, Major League Baseball is replacing Amazon Web Services with Google Cloud as its new data and analytics partner. It's a multi-year pact that now means you'll see this is StatCast powered by Google Cloud instead of StatCast powered by AWS. Uh, StatCast is, of course, the service that analyzes player performance and abilities. MLB will also use Google Ad Manager and its dynamic ad insertion feature for its digital ads business for the third year in a row. Foxconn expects revenue to drop 15% in the first quarter due to shutdowns and travel restrictions related to the COVID-19 outbreak. However, the company believes normal production should resume by the end of March. Foxconn operates several factories in China, and Apple is, of course, one of its biggest customers. And it was mostly good news. Uh, Google announced Pixel owners were getting uh, new update features, including additional music controls, emoji, more photo and video features, expanded emergency help features though Google's personal safety app through Google's personal safety app. Uh, Google Play improvements, bunch more, unless you're on AT&T. Uh, Google has pulled the update for AT&T Pixel 4 and Pixel 4 XL phones. No official word on why yet. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Amazon's plans, Sarah. Amazon announced that by adding smaller fulfillment centers in certain metro areas, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Orlando, and Dallas, all U.S. cities, it can increase same-day deliveries in those areas by 3 million items, which is a really big increase because Prime Now, which is the existing same-day service, offers about 20,000 items for rapid delivery, along with groceries. So customers will now see a new Today Buy tag on items that are eligible. Not all items are, but quite a few are now. And then there's an overnight de uh, delivery option as well. So if you ordered something before midnight, you could get it at 8 a.m. the next morning, for example. So it's different than one day delivery, which they're trying to make standard, where one day could mean at the end of the day the next day. Overnight means you get it earlier. Right. Uh, Basically, you get this first thing in the morning yeah. as long as you order you know, at a reasonable hour the night before, which... Yeah, there are a lot of items where I would I would really prefer that. Uh, and Amazon says this would cut down on fuel use because you're ordering from things that are close to you, so they don't have to they, they don't have to go by plane to get to you. Except they had to go by plane at some point, so I'm not sure how much how much that that washes with me. Seth, what do you, uh, do you do? You have any feelings about Amazon cutting down delivery time? Given how many packages get stolen, uh, how can you tell? <laughs> If they're there before you order it, and yet it's not there when you open the door, it doesn't matter. You'll be able to know whether it was stolen faster now. Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Worth every prime penny. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of these kind of super huge fulfillment centers, which you can't just plop down in the middle of a city— Right. Uh, you have to ha you have to have room for them that you know the company over time, especially because Amazon now has a lot of other competition for uh, all of the goods that you want as quickly as possible for the right price, has figured out, you know, we don't always need all that stuff in the big old super huge warehouse. It's better to figure out, okay, well, what 
is a, you know, an average customer in Philadelphia, for example, ordering enough that the smaller mm. fulfillment center, let's just stock it with that. And, you know, we save on fuel and Amazon is of course pushing its whole, uh, uh, reduced carbon footprint initiative as are many other companies, but this is a, one way that you get there or get closer. A new lightweight version of Facebook Messenger for iOS is live, uh, rolling out slowly, so you may or may not have it already. The iOS version has shrunk from 130 megabytes to 30 megabytes and is going from 1.7 million lines of code down to 360,000. Uh, if you remember F8 last year, they called this Project Lightspeed. It was supposed to ship last year, but it missed its deadline because it was more complicated than they thought. In fact, VP of Messenger Stan Chudnovsky told Fast Company, it was like remodeling a house and discovering discovering new problems when you open up the walls. Uh, like, oh, there's there's dry rot. Crap. We need to rip out these lines of code now. Uh, it doesn't look too much different if you get the new version other than the taking up less space and launching faster. Uh, the Discover tab is removed. That's one noticeable thing. Uh, the People tab got a redesign. Inbox read receipts and polls are temporarily gone. They say they're going to come back. But Facebook intends to incorporate some of the updates into future Android versions, so the Android version of Messenger should get lighter as well. What I found most fascinating about this is not so much that they changed anything in the way Messenger works. Uh, it's a little bit impressive that they were able to cut down the code that much. But if you read the Fast Company article, it talks a lot about what they found when they focused on this because they had such a huge group of engineers working on this over time. Uh, there was a lot of redundant code, uh, especially mm -hmm. picking people. They found that there was like multiple ways that the code could pick a person. And so they were able to just rip all that out and put one object that said, here's the people picking code. Every, every call should use that. Uh, microservices were replaced with SQLite database, uh, which brought down uh, a lot of the code base as well. Uh, Seth, I feel like this, this is something that they'll be able to learn from in other projects and be able to be more efficient in coding in the future. Well, one could hope. I mean, I, I think that there's something really, really interesting about this. And it's not often that uh, average consumers like us encounter technical debt, right? We just know that Facebook runs slower, or Messenger runs slower, or we're having difficulty with an app that's just not behaving the way it should, or a website. But this kind of technical debt, I think, is actually a huge, huge problem in uh, how you know s uh, systems and services get developed. And the fact that Messenger has only been around for uh, what, maybe 10, not even 10 years as a standalone app? I think they bought app, Beluga like five in years? 2012. So eight years it's been in development. And then they sort of created it as a, as they integrated it and then they ripped and it out. Pulled it out, and, yeah. And, and so it's been, what, less than five years or maybe around five years as its own thing. And they were able to shave three quarters of the code off. Uh, I think that's remarkable. And I think we're going to see huge problems in services that people are using that are far more uh, uh, dependent on on their code bases and have far bigger code bases than Messenger, when th when the technical debt in those comes calling, um, I, I I just I I think it's really neat, and I think we're all going to be in uh, some deep trouble because of it. <laughs> yeah, I did. one one last point on this. I think uh, I was most entertained by what Chudnovsky was saying about, or not entertained, but most interested in Chudnovsky saying that they really learned better practices to prevent the code from getting so bloated in the future. And I'll, I'll be curious to see if that plays out, if they're able to, yeah. to make that happen. I'm going to yeah. need those inbox read receipts back, though. It's very, <laughs> gotta, very gotta important. <laughs> very important for passive-aggressive fan trips. Analyst Ming-Chi Kuo sent a note to investors saying that his sources indicate that Apple has six products coming this year and next year that will use mini LEDs. Those products include 12.9-inch iPad Pro, a 27-inch iMac Pro, a 14.1-inch MacBook Pro, a 16-inch MacBook Pro, a 10.2-inch iPad, and a 7.9-inch iPad Mini. Many LEDs are smaller, so they can use more backlights and control uh, local dimming better and deliver improved contrast, brightness, and black levels. Uh, yeah, 14.1-inch MacBook Pro. I mean, that in itself is is an interesting quo uh, uh, prediction here that, that we right. would get, get a, a smaller version of the MacBook Pro similar to the 16, where it's going to take up the same size but have a larger screen. Uh, and just, you know, better looking screens, uh, putting mini LEDs in there. I, I'm not sure how much this matters to the average person, but a lot of people are, are screen nerds and, you know, want the best looking screen they can get. And this could help with that.
What do we think about pricing for something like this? Let's say all of these products come to yeah, market. Yeah, how much should this add to the price? Because that's, uh, a, you know, that's the consumer is probably, well, maybe it's a little bit like Retina Display where if you don't have it, you're like, is it really that great? And then once you have it, you're like, yes, it is. I'll never go back. Uh, so maybe it's one of these things. But yes, does, does the price um, of this better technology end up being a higher price for a product? And because it's an Apple, will you notice? Seth, what do you think? Uh, I'm, I, I hate to be such a Debbie Downer, except I, I don't really hate it, but I'm curious <laughs> to see how many, like how many of these are, are even going to ship because of the impact of Corona, uh, and COVID-19. I think there's, there's just, there, there's so many unknowns that are happening this year mm -hmm. because of it. Even if they've got them designed and ready to be built in the factories, maybe the factories aren't going to be able to handle building them. Um, price points could be wildly changed because Apple may either want to move product or they may not be able to ship enough product. Um, and that could affect what they're charging for it. I mean, I, I have no idea. I wouldn't be surprised in a normal year if they wind, if they would wind up charging an extra hundred bucks for, for the latest. Uh, I think historically that's sort of what we've seen from them. Um, but in terms of, of like, what's the impact this year? I, I think it's a lot of, who knows? Yeah, no, I mean, Quo said that given current situations, the supply chain for these shouldn't be affected, but you're right. Yeah. That's current situation. We don't know what the situation is going to turn into. Yeah. Local U.S. news app Smart News announced it has now reached to partnerships with publishers in more than 6,000 cities. Uh, Smart News has a tab for local news based on location sharing from the app's user. Articles are picked by machine learning, but only from sources curated by a team of journalists. Smart News claims it wants to break users out of media bubbles by doing this. The election news tab, for instance, has a slider that lets you choose to see news for each presidential candidate from a left, right, or center perspective. You can kind of experiment how that changes what you would see. Members of the Smart News engineering product data and marketing teams have also gone on listening tours. Uh, where they go to Minnesota, Iowa, Nevada, and California so far to just hear local concerns. Like, what what don't you get from your news? What would you like to get from your news? Uh, they're planning to do that for Michigan and Florida, particularly for election coverage, not just local. These are these are important electoral states you may recognize there. Uh, but this is this is an interesting app because it kind of to me strikes a difference, a middle way between Google News and Apple's news app. So Apple's news app to me is very magazine heavy. It doesn't really have all the sources I want in it because Apple hasn't been able to strike all the partnerships. Whereas Google News has everybody in it, which means that it's often polluted by a lot of things that are unreliable or clickbaity. Or you just uh, don't care about. Yeah, or I just don't care. And Smart News, I've, I've tried it for a little bit now, seems to have a really good handle on these are good, reliable sources that you can trust but our machine learning is good at showing you important things, showing you things that you might be interested in reading about today. Yeah, the local uh, news angle, I think. Oh, go ahead, Seth. Sorry. I, I Again, like these, these machine learning, uh, AI-generated uh, or curated stories really, really worry me, especially with, with local news. There were two big reports in the New York Times and the Atlantic at the end of last year focusing on how uh, disinformation campaigns are pivoting to use local news sites. Um, given how machine learning algorith algorithms tend to be black boxes that we don't have a lot of independent uh, uh, in, uh, insight into, we don't have a lot of independent sources looking at how they're constructed, um, I think it's going to be really easy to manipulate these. Well, and that, uh, I'm, that's I'm why I like about that. I like that Smart News doesn't just rely on the machine learning. They have a human team monitoring it. And I think that's super smart to say, we know this is a black box and can be manipulated. So we're going to have humans looking at it on, on the lookout. And I have to say, so far, it's yeah. way better than what you see from a Google News. I, I, I hope so. I mean, I hope that continues. Uh, I just, I know, you know, we all know that that uh, Facebook had, you know, people or has theoretically people sitting in on its algorithm, helping curate things. Google is supposed to be doing that as well with Google News, YouTube videos. I, I, I'm just I'm I'm uh, very cautious about how we are moving forward. And there's not a lot of independent authority saying, yes, this is this is being uh, authentically chosen or being manipulated. Um, and it's those manipulations that, that worry me because what we saw on Facebook is that once somebody gets used to seeing a news from a particular source 
then and even if it looks completely le legitimate, it can be exploited to help spread misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and if it's a site that they're using to replace the local news that they used to have, uh, you know, but but some big conglomerate bought the TV station or the newspaper and and gutted it. Um, I, I think this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, something we should be very trepidatious about. The, the one thing to, to remember when you're thinking about this, and Seth's bringing up some very good things to think about, is what Facebook and Google News do is let the machine learning spew out the stuff, and then the humans are on the other end looking for problems. What I like about smart news, may or may not work, is that they have the humans at the beginning, and right. then they're feeding what they think is good information into machine learning. And if we've learned anything about ML, it's that it's only as good as the data you put into it. Facebook and Google are letting anyone put anything into it. Smart News is saying, we'll feed it right. what we think is a good diet so that it hopefully puts out better stuff. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. But it's an interesting thing to keep an eye on. Payment service Boku has noted a 30% rise in payments over the last two months due in part to the effects of, you guessed it, the COVID-19 virus in Never South Korea, <laughs> right? Hong Kong, Thailand, Taiwan, the Philippines, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, and Oman. Boku is an online payment system tied to a mobile number accepted on many entertainment websites like Spotify, PlayStation, gambling websites use it as well. And Google announced it will make uh, advanced hangouts meet video conferencing capabilities available to all G Suite and G Suite for Education customers until July 1st of this year. The features include larger meetings and live streaming and the ability to record and save meetings for later viewing. This is interesting because we were almost sort of saying, I wonder what the rise in remote conferencing software is going to look like. There probably will be some, but we're already seeing the effects of, of, of how this works. Yeah, I mean, it's a good PR stunt for Google, uh, but it also benefits companies that are like, we're going to have to make people work from home, uh, but we didn't pay for the capacity to have meetings with more than 250 people or you know more than 1,000 people live streaming at a, at a time. And so Google's making that easier for them for a period of time uh, with the idea that maybe once the virus scare has passed, uh, you know, fingers crossed, it, it doesn't uh, continue past July 1st, maybe they can get some of these companies to to stay on with the paid plan. Right. Uh, the, the Boku note is interesting because we've seen a lot of companies impacted negatively by this, uh, but there are also companies that provide a service, you know, if somebody in China particularly, right, or in Korea now, uh, Italy has to stay inside, uh, they're going to look for things to entertain themselves. And, and Boku happens to be benefiting from that as a payment service. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Well, we heard at the beginning of the show of the cancellations of conferences that are happening, but the RSA conference uh, went on as planned, even with a few companies pulling out of it. Uh, and Seth, you were there. Uh, yes. First off, uh, how was the mood there? How, what was it like being at this conference in the middle of, of this kind of concern? Sure. Uh, I mean, for one thing, it was really interesting just as someone who who has been going long enough that they hand me a legacy pin every time I go now. And, and I, I feel very awkward about that because <laughs> um, uh, it's been, yee, uh, I think, a decade or so of, of attending these things, maybe more. Um, and. And in, in the new Moscone Center, you know they they revamped it. There's now a third floor uh, on the uh, on the south building, and and there's connection bridges and everything. Um, and so the conference, ha which had begun to spread out to nearby hotels and 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 conference areas in those hotels, now sort of recondensed back into Moscone. And so I was expecting it to be very crowded and very tight, um, and that just wasn't the case. Walking the halls uh, was quite easy. Uh, the show floor, which I really try to avoid, like uh, the plague, uh, was sorry, uh, was uh, also fairly easy to maneuver around on, um, uh, and I thought that was uh, uh, different. <laughs> uh, and I, I asked the conference if they could tell me how many attendees they had this year compared to previous years. They have not yet shared that information mm -hmm. with me. Um, they had uh, more than a few sponsors pull out. They had 14, I think it was at the last count, sponsors pull out. I think six were from China and the rest were uh, uh, Western, co uh, uh, Western companies. Um, so there was definitely a, uh, a different tone on the show floor. People were uh, very cautious about using uh, 
uh, hand sanitizer. There was a lot of washing of hands, uh, a little bit of gnashing of teeth as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but there were still some good stories, and, and one that I've seen a lot of people talking about this today is uh, the penetration tester whose mom yes. was his was the CFO at his company, uh, and he sent her in to do pen testing at a prison. Uh, this this is an amazing story. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so so for the people who don't who don't know or don't understand uh, why they do this, penetration testers are often hired uh, by. Organizations can be small companies, can be uh, municipalities uh, to test their networks. Um, and a lot of that also means going into a physical space and dropping USB keys into every open USB port you can find, uh, see what kind of data you can exfiltrate from that. Um, and this is usually on the up and up. Uh, recently, there was a problem with, uh, I think it was an Iowa uh, courthouse uh, where there were, the communication was not great and the pen testers were actually arrested for doing what they had been hired to do. Uh, I think the case was finally thrown out. But this is a very common thing in uh, cybersecurity, especially in this space where cybersecurity and physical security intersect. Um, can you make a fake badge? Can you social engineer your way into a building? Uh, or are they more cautious about it? Uh, financial services companies actually tend to be very good about this. They're very worried about, uh, uh, you know, uh, people breaking into a building, especially, you know, Wall Street uh, uh, style companies. Uh, Silicon Valley, because ne uh, teams tend to be uh, uh, more disparate, you've got people working remotely from home from a lot of different satellite offices, um, tend to be more lax about these things. And so, uh, uh, there was actually a talk just about this at uh, B-Sides, which is a RSA uh, sort of side conference, um, not officially related to RSA. And uh, so this guy sent his mom in, and she was able to, uh, to put USB keys on every open computer that she could find. Uh, she uh, got in with a fake badge and a fake business card uh, pointing to her son as her manager, uh, which I'm sure uh, tickled them to no end. Uh, and he was able to talk about it. Now, I, I think because the NDA had finally cleared uh, on that. Yeah, they, they didn't mention the actual prison still. Uh, and no. his mom has passed away since yes. then uh, as well, sadly. Uh, but yeah, anybody who knows Darren Kitchen and Hack 5, they were using rubber duckies uh, by right. name. Uh, right. So it was like Angela from Mr. Robot. Like they sent <laughs> mom in to just stick rubber duckies uh, in, into as many things as possible. It was pretty crazy. Uh, also, uh, we mentioned the crook vulnerability uh, earlier this week on, on the show. Uh, mm -hmm. But but if you could real quick, Seth, just is there anything that people need to realize? This is a vulnerability in a couple of different chipsets, right? Uh, two chipsets. It affected Broadcom and Cypress. And, uh, the, and Cypress used to be part of Broadcom. Uh, they're the uh, IoT division that got spun out and I think uh, acquired by Cypress in, in 2016, I think it was. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it sounds pretty scary. Uh, there, were, there were more than a billion devices affected, uh, including uh, basically everything that Mac makes, that Apple makes, uh, most of what uh, Amazon makes, um, and as well as uh, Huawei routers, Asus routers, a bunch of others. Um, the routers, I think people should still be very concerned about the uh, consumer uh, uh, devices that you've got in your hand, less so because those have automatic updates, uh, or at least they should. If you've disabled automatic updates, uh, I hope you have a very good reason for that. Please go do your updates. Um, Patching is is a complicated business, uh, it, it, and, and part of it is because devices like routers still to this day don't have automatic updates the way that your phone does or the way that your laptop does. Um, you know, and it used to be a big deal. Uh, I remember when browsers started suddenly having automatic updates. That was a Google Chrome thing, uh, and it was uh, uh, up for debate. And and it's amazing how important it, it became in shutting down vulnerabilities. Um, but these other devices that don't have auto updates, uh, patch, you know, patch early, patch often. Um, there's, it's one of the, you know, core tenants of, of, uh, keeping your stuff safe. Uh, finally, uh, you, you wanted to, to note a keynote from Wendy Nather, uh, from, uh, what is she from Cisco? Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. She's, uh, uh, go on. Uh, she, uh, from what I'm reading here was talking about changing up how you 
not, I don't want to say market, but how you how you get people to pay attention to security. One of the things that caught my eye was was saying we really need to make user design better for security so that people want to use it so it's easy to use. Yep. Uh, and I want to I want to find her quote here about the spoon. She says, "What if they could design security to be easy as a spoon? We don't need annual spoon awareness training." <laughs> <laughs> well, I've. I've seen some people eat, and I have to say, some people do need <laughs> spoon awareness training, and perhaps bibs. Um, but, but I, I, you know, what what Wendy was talking about, I think, is really important because it's something that came up at the Enigma conference in San Francisco at the end of, of uh, January with a talk from Leah Kistner, uh, where security products are designed to fail, um, and the fact that we have we continually have to this day the same problems that we've had in cybersecurity going back more than two or three decades. Um, and uh, the, the, this, this belief that it's part of it is because the products are not being designed to be usable, they're being designed for security. Uh, and, that's, and, and Wendy had a great turn of phrase. She said that we need to think of, of security as a service. Mm -hmm. um, and who are we, not, not just a service that gets pushed out to consumers, but a service that is providing an important need but something that you don't really want to be thinking about, right? We mm -hmm. don't think about software as a service. It just is there. And I think the same thing with security is a really important point. Um, I hope it's the start of a change in philosophy as to how uh, security experts are approaching the products that they design. Um, because there's so much failure in telling people, you know, don't uh, click on this link in your email. Um, and people, and, and, and this was sort of a shock to me, but people have been fired for that. Um, it's, you know, it's really, uh, kind of horrific what's being expected of the average, uh, employee of a company, especially now that software is in everything. So, yeah. you know, focusing on this, I think is, is going to be huge. It, it felt like she was saying, let's stop telling people they should be better at security and make it really hard for them not to be good at security. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you, Seth. Appreciate the uh, the updates from RSA and 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 braving a conference at this time in our history. <laughs> <laughs> so far, I seem to be okay. My my dog is happy. The girlfriend good. seems to not be angry at me for going. So good, good. There, there are worse things. Uh, thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. Lots of security stories there every day, among others. You can submit a story that you care about and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join in the conversation in our Discord. And you can join Discord by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. What's in the mailbag, Sarah? Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Uh, James wrote in and said, the loss of support for Google Reader may not be comparable for the prospects of Stadia. This is a conversation we were having yesterday. But but uh, James says, the drop of support for Daydream VR, I think, is. I was one of the people who bought into Daydream, and Google has dropped support. They're no longer involved in developing apps. They have cut support for the device in their most recent phones, and they're letting the platform die. I thought Daydream worked really well. It would have done much better if it had been supported by Google better. If Stadia doesn't perform as quickly as expected, how long will Google's attention span linger before they cut and run? like they did with Daydream. Ah, uh, James, that is an excellent comparison, especially on uh, the developer. There, there's there's a little difference in that Daydream was never uh, marketed as, as much as Stadia to the end user, but a lot of interesting parallels there. So thank you for that. Also, uh, shout out to Scott, operations engineer with a Canadian city, who wanted to thank us for talking about the dangers of improper lithium ion battery disposal. Uh, he basically says, he primarily deals with landfill operations and the frequency of landfill fires being caused by batteries has to be increasing just from his personal experience. Uh, he said, our last fire, I had the luck of actually being the first person to spot and respond to, and the mangled remains make it hard to determine what it was, but the number of cells makes me think it was something like a lawnmower battery pack. The ability for these batteries to put out an extreme amount of heat is impressive, especially because it's chemical en energy. Landfill operators develop a quick eye for these things. One of our incidents a few years ago was a Mophie pack that was spotted smoking and removed before anything else caught fire. It was able to be spotted among all the waste with really no sign of smoke from the cab of a landfill compactor. While in most industries, a fire is a rare emergency event, in the waste industry, I now consider a fire an event that is to be expected, not a potential event. Uh, so, yeah, be careful. Don't throw those batteries into the trash or the recycling, either one. L literally a dumpster fire. Yeah, yeah.
Yes, <laughs> literally. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Jeffrey Zilks, Michael Kepper, and Paul Reese. Also, thanks to Seth Rosenblatt for being with us on DTNS today. Such a pleasure, Seth. Thank you so Thank much you. for bring, bringing the knowledge and letting us know how RSA was. Also, let folks know how they can keep up with the rest of your work. Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Seth R. Uh, the Parallax publishes on Twitter at The Parallax, no hyphen. And our website is the-parallax.com. Uh, we have a weekly newsletter as well, because uh, you don't need yet another website to go to all the time. But we appreciate it when you do. Thanks Excellent. for having me on. Yeah, thanks for being here, man. And uh, thanks to everybody who makes it possible for us to do these shows. Uh, it is your direct support that provides the vast majority of our budget. Uh, so if you uh, want to continue to make this content possible and power other content, we do product reviews with Live With It. We do uh, editor's desk for more opinion-oriented content. That's all available to patrons as a bonus, as a thank you at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>